All right, hi everyone. I don't want to put this on my ear, so I'm just going to say hi. Um, my name is Catherine. I run all of our developer outreach, including all these wonderful meetups. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. It's really nice to see you all. Uh, lots of familiar faces and some new faces too, so it's always good. Um, we're going to have Brian here talk about Pebble Smart Straps. We're going to have Alex from Hackster.io talk a little bit about Hackster and some of the really cool projects that uh, were made uh, last weekend at Pebble Rocks Boulder, which was a hackathon we did in Boulder, Colorado, uh, which was really kind of the first premier, hey, what are smart straps? Hey, let's build some stuff, um, which is really cool. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Brian here. All right, uh, my name is Brian. I work on the firmware team at Pebble, and I'm happy to tell you guys about Pebble Smart Straps today. Uh, so first of all, what is a Smart Strap? So the way I like to think about it is a Smart Strap is anything that connects both mechanically and electrically to the watch and enhances the Pebble experience for the user. So if you look on the back of your watch, you might notice that we have uh, a certain, we have four different electrical connections that, you, that interface the watch, usually with the charger and can also interface with a smart strap. So what are those connections actually for? So the outside two are where the magnets connect and that's, that is, uh, those are the ground pins. On the inside we have a single data line and we have a power pin. This power pin is used both to charge the watch from USB power uh, with the charger that supplies five volts and charges your watch. And also for smart straps, it can supply 3.3 volts out from the watch to whatever you have in your smart strap. So if you notice here, we have a single data pin. So how do we facilitate sort of bi-directional communication over that single data pin? So we developed our own sort of custom protocol uh, called the smart strap protocol which defines what the bits actually look like over that data pin and how the watch and the smart strap talk to each other. So like any good protocol, or, sorry, before I get to that, uh, the first thing that we decided was to make sort of a master-slave model because we only have one data pin. We need to figure out how we avoid both the smart strap and the watch talking at the same time. So we went with this master-slave model where the watch is the master and the smart strap is the slave, which basically means that the watch can talk whenever it wants, and the smart strap can only respond when the watch explicitly requests it to do so. So the watch basically has full control over the single data pin, and it can give up that control uh, when it chooses to do so to the smart strap in order to get data back. So the typical problem with this sort of master-slave model is there's no way for the smart strap to send like an interrupt or any sort of event back to the watch. Say, for instance, you had some user input on your smart strap, like a button or something. The best way to check if that button would be pressed would be to just constantly pull, you know, is the button pressed, is the button pressed over and over. And that's really not a good, you know, that's really not a good experience for both developers and it also drains the battery pretty quickly. So what we came up with was a notification mechanism, which is basically just an exception to this master-slave model where the smart strap can send this notification back to the watch and essentially acts as an interrupt but over just that single data pin. So if you're familiar with things like I2C, uh, in I2C you have separate interrupt lines going from the slave back to the master, and that's how the slave notifies the master when something happens. Uh, for instance, say you have an accelerometer, you might set up an interrupt when you know, there's some jolt of acceleration. Maybe somebody is you know, smashing on their watch or something like that. But since we only have the single data line, we needed to come up with this mechanism that you know, is basically just the slave sending us data back over the data line uh, and thus sort of handling that as an exception to this master-slave model. So the last thing is that the protocol ensures that data arrives either intact or not at all, meaning if the data gets corrupted on the line, we don't leave that up to the developers to deal with. We actually internally will reject that data and then you'll hit some timeout or something depending on what you're doing. Uh, so that way you know when you actually receive the data from the smart strap, you know it's exactly as you sent it, and vice versa, when you receive data on the smart strap from the watch, you know that data is completely intact, and you don't have to sort of deal with your own uh, sort of corruption detection or anything like that. We do that all for you. So like any good protocol or, you know, 
any good protocol stack, we have three different layers to our protocol. So the bottom layer is the physical layer, and for us this is standard UART. Uh, UART is just a basic serial protocol. Uh, for those who know UART, it's just standard 8 and 1, meaning 8 data bits per byte, no parity, and 1 stop bit. And at the default is a 9600 baud rate, so 9600 bits per second. However, this can be changed later depending on how fast the smart strap can talk, which I'll get to in a little bit. So on top of that, we have the link layer, and link layer is basically responsible for framing messages and making sure that there's no corruption uh, from point A to point B. And it also has things like the head, it has like a header which contains things like, you know, who sent the message and what type of message it is, if it's a notification, et cetera. And lastly, we have the profile layer. So the profile layer is where we actually send the data that we want to send. This is what defines what those sort of high level messages look like. So we have three different profiles. We have the link control profile. This one is used, is handled completely internally in the firmware. Uh, we also have an Arduino library, which I'll get to in a little bit, and we handle the link control profile for you completely, you know, in the background uh, if you're using that library. So you don't have to worry about the link control profile in your application. Uh, the two profiles that you might want to, you know, take advantage of are the raw data profile or the generic service profile. The raw data profile is basically just we don't define any sort of format for what the data has to be. We don't define any maximum length. We don't define any maximum timeout um, other than the constraints put on your message by the lower layers. So it's just if you want to stream data or you don't know how much data you're going to send, the raw data might be what you would use. Uh, the generic service profile, if you're familiar with uh, Bluetooth or BLE, uh, it's similar to GAT where basically you define some attributes on the smart strap and the watch makes, makes requests based on those attributes. And this is ideally what most smart apps would use because it gives you a nice framework for sort of developing what your smart app is going to do, what capabilities it has, and also allows some interop interoperability between uh, different smart apps potentially. So the generic service profile, I'm going to go into a little more detail. Uh, as I said, the generic service profile is made up of attributes that are defined on the smart strap. So an attribute is basically any distinct piece of information. So for example, if you had a GPS smart strap, you might have an attribute that represents the longitude and latitude. You might have an attribute that represents how many GPS satellites you're actually connected to. You might have a, uh, an attribute that defines your um, uh, altitude, uh, different things that your smart strap is going to provide back to the watch. Uh, also, you know, for a heart rate sensor, you might have an attribute that represents the heart rate. And lastly, a service is basically just a collection of similar attributes. So if you see at the bottom here, for example, I have this battery service, and this battery service has two attributes. The first one is the level, and the second one is the capacity. The level is basically the percentage of charge in the battery, and the capacity is the total number of milliamp hours that that battery can store. And this would be if your smart strap had its own battery that was powering the watch, for instance. So the service ID and attribute ID are 16-bit integers, so that gives us a pretty big range of possible attributes that you can define and a big range of possible services that people can, can come up with. I don't know if we'll ever come up with 65,000 services, uh, but we'd split them up into different ranges for uh, different purposes. So the main purpose that you might be interested in is the experimentation range, and that's basically we don't care what you do in that range uh, as long as it's for prototyping or you know, just hacking around or development or whatever you want to do. If, say, you made some smart strap and you were hacking around in the experimentation range and now you actually wanted to productize your smart strap, what you would then do is you would contact us and we would give you a new service ID that belongs just to you in the commercial range. And that way you know if you see a smart strap with the service ID, you know exa exactly that it's your smart strap and you know exactly what it supports because you made it. Uh, we have a few other ranges. We have a spec defined range, which is basically common services that we can see people using. Um, like that battery service I showed, also we have one for GPS and heart rate. Uh, and these are things that we define exactly what the attributes are, and if you conform to that, then we can sort of ensure that we can assume that any arbitrary smart strap that it implements that service implement it, implement it the same way. So you don't necessarily need to know exactly what the smart strap is. If it implements that service, you know automatically what it supports. Uh, lastly, at the top we have an invalid range, which is just, you know, invalid, you can't use those, and a reserved range, which we use internally for sort of service discovery and other sort of 
management stuff that happens behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh, so the purpose of the invalid service range is we actually alias the raw data, raw data profile as service ID zero, and we might do other things like that in the future with future profiles. So we just are reserving this for sort of that special meaning. So what's the difference between that and reserved? So reserved is those are actual services. Oh, sorry. So the the first question was what's the purpose of the reserved range, and that's oh, sorry the invalid range, and the invalid range is for things that we might use for other purposes, uh, not necessarily generic service. Uh, the reserved range is for th internal things that we actually do implement those services, but we're not exporting them to third-party developers. So for instance, when the SmartShap connects, which I'll get to in a minute, it does the service discovery, so it figures out what services the SmartShap supports, and all that message, all that you know, communication happens with services and attributes within that reserved range. Uh, so the first thing that you would do if you wanted to develop a smart trap is figure out what service and attributes your smart trap would support. So for instance, I've created this super awesome service with service ID of 1234, and as you can see, this falls into that experimentation range. Uh, and this service has a single attribute called color, which gets the favorite color of the smart trap. So now we have the service defined, so let's take a step back and look at how we actually connect between or how the watch makes a connection to the smart shop. So the first thing that the watch does is it turns on power to the smart shop. The smart shop will boot up and uh, then the watch will send it this profile discovery message. Basically, we know that smart shops have to support the link control profile because that's how we actually you know, set up this connection. Uh, but we don't know if it supports the raw service or the generic or both or none. So we send this profile discovery message uh, the watch, or sorry, the smart chat will respond. In this case, it'll say, I support all the profiles, which would be the VA data profile and the generic service profile. The next thing that we do is we just send a message to the smart chat saying, are you ready to go? Is, you know, what's your status? Uh, in this case, for the purpose of this example, the smart chat responds saying, I want to change the baud rate. So as I said earlier, the higher layers can change the baud rate from the default 9600. Was there a question? Yeah. Uh, so, it can, but it has to reconnect. So once we connect, then those services are locked in. Those profiles and services are locked in. But there is a way for the smart app to force a reconnection if new services become available. Um, and sorry, the question was, is there, can smart apps, you know, support new services coming online later than the initial connection, essentially? So services and Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can think of a service as just some, basically it could be a single sensor or it could be a single piece of the smart strap. Uh, but generally they would all come online at the same time. So, okay, so in this case the smart strap responds saying I want to change the baud rate. Now the watch sends a new, or sorry, the watch will update its baud rate to that baud rate that the smart strap requested. And at the same time, the smart chat would have updated its own baud rate and will send a new message saying, again, are you ready to go? What's your status? In this case, if they both change the baud rates uh, at the same time or correctly, then the smart chat will respond saying status okay, and at this point, we're connected. Uh, so we're connected, but we don't know what services the smart chat supports, so we can't really talk to it yet. So what happens at this point is the watch will send a service discovery message, which is using one of those service IDs and attribute IDs within that reserved service range. Uh, so it sends this message to the smart trap, and the smart trap responds, in this case, saying that it supports this 1234 service that I made up. Uh, so let's look at what this actually looks like in the code on the Pebble side. So on the Pebble side, the first thing that we do is we want to create a attribute sort of quote unquote object, basically a smart strap attribute pointer that represents the service and attribute that we actually care about. So in this case, I created this service with service ID of 1234 and attribute ID 42, uh, both in hex. So I'm just creating a color attribute to represent that service, uh, to re represent that attribute, sorry, call, by calling smart strap attribute create. And I'm just passing the service ID, attribute ID, and the length. The length is just what's the fixed size of the messages for that attribute. In this case, it's just one byte. And then lastly, in the init, I'm calling smart subscribe, 
and I'm going to get to a little bit later what the actual handlers are here that we all subscribe, but these are going to be things like you know, callbacks when we get requests from the smart shops and when services become available. Uh, in the DNIT, we do pretty standard stuff, just clean up what we use, clean up the attribute that we created, and unsubscribe the handlers. Now, on the SmartStrap side, uh, we created this Arduino Pebble Serial Library, which implements the SmartStrap protocol. So the way that you set that up is in your setup function in Arduino, and for those of you who don't know, basically the way most Arduino sketches are structured is you have a setup where you do all your initialization, and then you have a loop function, which Arduino just calls over and over forever. Uh, so in the setup here, you would call this begin software, for instance. Um, and you pass in what pin the watch is connected on, you pass in a buffer that you've created, uh, you pass in what baud rate you want to talk at. In this case, we want to change the baud rate to 57.6K, because that's about the most that most Arduino boards can support. And we pass in the services that the smart shop supports. So the first one was for uh, smart watch, and the first one was for smart yeah. watch. The, the question was, what was the previous slide for? And that was, this is the watch code. Uh, so this is, and this is the smart shop code using the Arduino library that we provide. So now how do we, so now that we've established a connection, how do we actually read that attribute? Uh, so the first thing that we do is on the watch, we're gonna send a request saying, I wanna read this attribute. We pass the attribute ID and the service ID, and that goes to the smart shop. Now the smart shop is gonna respond saying, you know, this is, my value for that attribute, in this case, I picked green. This is the pebble byte code for green. Uh, and it's gonna send that back to the watch. So again, the smart chat can't just send that anytime it wants. It can only send it you know, immediately after the watch actually requests that data, uh, as you can see here. So what does that look like on the watch side? Well, we just use that attribute that we created earlier and we simply call smartstrap <laughs> attribute read. That's gonna queue up a read request. It's gonna send that to the smartstrap. Now on the smart shop side, uh, what's gonna happen is within our loop function, we're gonna call this feed function. And basically the way Arduino works is it's only single threaded, so you have to actually give the library a chance to process the incoming data. And we do that by calling this feed function. So the way feed works is that it'll return true when we actually get a complete message from the watch. And when that happens, it'll populate these uh, local variables that we've defined here. So it'll tell you the service ID, attribute ID, length, and type of the request that we just got. So within the if statement here, you would process that request and uh, you know, take whatever action you need to do and write the response back to the watch. Uh, so in this case, we're just calling write. The first parameter, true, just means that it was successful. Uh, the second parameter is where the response actually lives, the buffer where it lives. And the third parameter is how many bytes we want to write back. In this case, just one. So the smart shop is now sending that data back to the watch. Now on the watch, one of those handlers that we subscribed was a did read handler. And that's gonna get called when we actually get that response back from the smart shop or when a timeout occurs. Uh, so you can see here the parameters are the attribute that we actually made the request on. In this case, that would be color adder, uh, that variable that I created. Uh, we're gonna get the results, which would either be smart shop result okay or possibly smart shop result timeout if we never heard back uh, within a certain amount of time. And we're gonna get the data and the number of bytes uh, that we actually got back from the smart shop. Yeah? Is there a service number? Uh, the question was, is there a service number available? So you can, we have APIs that you can call on the attribute to get the service ID and attribute that it, uh, it represents. So within this function, you would handle the read, assuming that it was successful and you know, process whatever data you got. So the next thing is, how does the smart shop send notifications to the watch? Uh, so say, for instance, the smart shop now changes, it, changes its mind and now it has a new favorite color. So it's gonna send a notification, which is, again, is just an exception to that sort of master-slave model that we allow. Uh, we use some special sort of UR tricks to make sure that we're not trying to talk at the same time that the watch is and that we can differentiate a notification from just a misbehaving smart shop that took too long to respond. So we're gonna send that back to the watch. On the smart shop side, that simply looks like a call to this notify function. We're just gonna pass the service ID and attribute ID that we wanna actually make that notification for. In this case, it's the same one that I've been using, uh, service 1234, attribute 42. Now on the watch side, another one of those handlers that we su subscribe using smart shop subscribe is a notify handler. And this, again, just gets called whenever we get this notification. So all that this gets passed is just the attribute. 
and say, you know, in a real world scenario, you might get a notification when some attribute changes. So within this handler, you might uh, then want to make a read request to get the new value of that attribute. Uh, one thing I'll point out here is that the watch doesn't necessarily have to do anything in response to a notification. It could just drop the notification if it wants to. Uh, the smart shop should be able, or shouldn't expect that the watch is always going to send it a request of that attribute after it sends a notification. It really just depends sort of what your model is and what you're using notifications for. So I have one, uh, I have a demo here which I'll show and then we'll walk through the code so you can see actually what it looks like in a more pseudo realistic uh, environment. So here I have my watch with a demo app that's connected to a TNT 3.1 board, uh, which is one of the boards that our library supports. Uh, it also supports like the Arduino Uno uh, and a few other boards. So all this demo is doing is it's showing the uptime of the TNT on the screen. This is the number of seconds that the TNT has been alive for since it last reset. Uh, and then the other cool thing that it does is if I push the up button on the pebble, it's going to turn the LED on. And if I push the down button, it's going to turn the LED off. So now we have this awesome smart chap which lets you turn on and off the LED. Woo. <laughs> so what does this actually look like in code? Uh, so let's look at the pebble code first. Okay, so at the top here, I've just created some constants to define my service and attribute. Actually, sorry, one thing I want to go to before that, uh, how is this connected electrically? So we made these sort of smart shop adapters. I have a few with me if you want to take a look at what they are, but it's basically just hacked apart charging cables that we solder some wires to that get soldered to some headers. And on the header, we actually soldered a really small uh, surface mount resistor because the data line is open drain, meaning the smart shop actually has to supply a pull-up resistor, basically a resistor between the data line and the power pin. Uh, and that's how we actually detect that the smart shop is present. And that's how we can do sort of high and low logic with an open drain output. So the next thing we want to do before we get to the code is define what the service and attributes are going to look like. So in this case, I've created a really cool service with service ID of 1001, and I've created two attributes to support this demo that you saw. The first is the LED status. Basically, this is a write attribute that lets you set whether the LED is on or off. The second is the uptime, and that's how we display on the screen how many seconds the watch or the smart shop has been up for. So now, uh, going back to the code, at the top here, I just have those services and attribute IDs defined. I have the lengths defined for those attributes. And then I have two variables to represent uh, those attributes, um, which I will create below. And then the last thing here is just some basic you know, Windows stuff, which if you develop Pebble apps, you're probably familiar with. Uh, so if I go down to my init routine, uh, at the top, I'm just setting up the window, uh, pretty standard. But here, I'm actually setting up the smart shop. So I'm registering three different handlers. The first is an availability did change handler. And that gets called when services become available or unavailable, essentially when we either connect or disconnect from the smart shop. Uh, the next is a did read handler, which we talked about a little while ago. Again, that just gets called when we get an actual read uh, message from the smart shop. And the last is a notify handler. Um, which I'll get to in a minute, but that's gets called when we get a notification from the smart shop. So the first thing I'm doing here is I'm just subscribing those handlers and then I'm creating those two attributes that I need, uh, the LED attribute and the uh, uptime attribute. So once the smart shop is actually connected, uh, we'll get an availability change handler. And one other thing that I should point out here is at the top you can see the bar is green and we show connected and that's actually handled uh, inside of this availability change handler. You can see I'm just changing the background color and changing the text when a service becomes available or unavailable. Okay, so what does that look like on the Arduino side? So again, I just have constants for the service ID, attribute ID, and lengths. Uh, and in the setup routine, so this might look a little bit weird because it's doing different things for different boards, but let's just look at the TNC board. We're just calling begin hardware, uh, passing in a buffer that we created up here, and passing in the baud rate 57.6K and the services that we support. Uh, 
So that's pretty much all that you need in order to establish a connection. Uh, the other thing that you need is to call feed over and over in a loop, uh, which I'll get to in a second. But this allows us to do that connection messages or that connected message at the top with the green background uh, when the smart app is connected. So for instance, if I disconnect the smart app here, then we'll see it'll, uh, it'll take a few seconds because we don't want to, you know, hastily disconnect from smart app whenever something goes wrong. But then the screen should say disconnected. You can see the timer stopped because we can no longer get the uptime. And after a few seconds, it should turn to red and say disconnected. There it goes. And now if I connect it again, it'll go back to connected and it'll continue counting. Uh, sort of, it, it leaped up because the smart app was actually still running, but now we got the most recent time and it's still communicating. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we handle that completely under the hood. Right, so the question was basically how does the app get notified when we connect or disconnect and it's just through that availability to change him, uh, callback. Uh, and we also provide an API where you can sort of pull what the connection status is of a service uh, if you just want to you know, know it in a, at a given instance if it's connected or disconnected. Uh, if it just depends on sort of whether you want to use callbacks or explicitly request it. So the question was why does it take, take so long to disconnect? Uh, the answer is one, we don't want to disconnect. If you're running around with your, your watch, you're likely not going to have the best connection, so we don't want to disconnect right away. And second, when you actually, when we change the baud rates during that initial connection, it actually can take us a while to reconnect because we want both the smart strap and the watch to revert back to that default baud rate before they try and connect again. Otherwise, we're going to try and talk at different baud rates and it's never going to work. Uh, so the timeout for changing back to that default baud rate uh, is a little bit, you know, it's about half of what you saw there. So that's from the timeouts. I'm sorry? It's from the timeouts that the timeout is longer? Yeah, so the question was, you know, just to go back, your question was why it takes so long. Uh, and yeah, it's about just the built-in timeouts on the smart strap side and on the uh, watch side. That's just how long we wait without hearing anything from the smart strap before we, you know, think that something might be wrong. Another thing about, or another thing I'll mention there is uh, the smart strap might not be talking to the watch all the time. Uh, for instance, if you had a GPS smart strap, you might only want to get the GPS data once every minute or something, and you don't want to be uh, trying to communicate constantly. But we do want to know if the smart strap gets disconnected. So we actually send some sort of internal status messages every five seconds or so to make sure that we're still connected, even if your app isn't explicitly requesting that data get sent back and forth. That, that's handled on the smartwatch side, not the strap? It's, well, it's handled on both sides, but it's handled uh, internally to the firmware on the watch side and the uh, library on the smart strap side. Okay, so going back to this, uh, the next thing that we want to do is be able to push the buttons and have the LED turn on and off. So if I scroll down here, you can see I'm just registering some uh, button click handlers. So when the up button is, click, is pressed, I'm calling this POV set LED attribute uh, with true. When you press the down button, it's passing false. So one thing I didn't go through before is write requests. So let's take a look at how those work. Uh, so in this case, we want to write to the smart strap. We don't really care what the and we don't care about getting data from the smart app. We just want to set the LED on or off. So the first thing that we do is we call smart app attribute begin write. And basically what this is going to, what this call is going to do is it's going to give, uh, give us a buffer that we can write the data into. Uh, and the reason for this is if you remember when we called smart app attribute create, we just specified the length of that attribute. We didn't actually create our own buffer or anything. So that buffer is sort of created on behalf of the app by the firmware. Uh, so calling smart strap attribute begin write lets you access that buffer so you can start writing data into it. Uh, once you've written the data, which I do here by setting just the first byte of the buffer to on, then you call smart strap attribute end write. And after this point, you can't use that buffer anymore. Uh, if you use it, some, you know, that behavior is undefined essentially and you shouldn't try and store that buffer somewhere else. Um, so once you call end write, we're actually going to queue up that request and send it off to the smart app with the data in the buffer that you set. So on the Arduino side, 
Again, we're calling, oops, sorry, here we go. Uh, we're calling a feed here. So once feed returns true, that means we got a request from the watch. Uh, one other thing I'll point out here is that feed will handle any of these like link control requests or any of these internal requests that are handled by the library feed will actually do that for you. And it'll be, you know, it'll return false as if nothing happened, but in the background it did all this stuff for you. Uh, so once feed returns true, it means we got a request that you actually need to do something about. Uh, so I'm just checking what the service ID and attribute ID are. So in this case, we would get a write request for the LED attribute ID. So I'm gonna go to this handle LED request function and you can see here, I'm just checking that it was a write request, that the length is what I expect, uh, just one byte, and then setting the LED on or off based on the actual data that we got along with that request. Uh, so the last thing I'm doing here is calling write uh, with true and passing null and zero. Uh, basically, this is writing nothing back to the watch. And the reason that we have to do this is uh, for the generic service profile, we expect the Smart app to acknowledge when writes are successful. And this sends that acknowledgement back to the watch. So the next thing that we want to do is get the uptime of the Smart app on the watch and display it on the screen. So one way that we could do this is just constantly request, send read requests, say what's your uptime over and over. Uh, that's going to be very, you know, that's going to use up a lot of CPU both on the watch and the smart app, and it's going to more importantly use up a bunch of battery power on your watch, which you don't want to do. So instead, we're using the notification mechanism. Uh, so the smart app is actually going to send a notification to the watch every time the uptime changes, basically once every second, and then the watch is going to perform a read request to get the latest uh, uptime value. So if I go down to my loop routine here, you can see that's what I'm doing here. Um, first just checking that we're actually connected because there's no point in sending a notification if the watch isn't connected to us. Uh, and then every second, I'm sending a notify by just calling uh, Arduino Pebble Serial Notify, passing in the service ID and the uptime attribute ID, and that's gonna send a notification from the smart strap uh, to the watch. So on the watch side, we're gonna get this notify handler. Uh, here we go. And the only thing I'm doing inside of this handler is just calling smartstrap attribute read to get the latest value of that attribute. Because the notification itself doesn't actually contain the data. It just tells us that you know, something happened with this attribute and now we can, do, we can either ignore it or we can do a read request to get the latest value. So unless the slave is sending Right, so the question is, uh, unless the, the slave, in this case a smart strap, is sending data, a notification to the watch, there's no data going back and forth for this attribute, which is true. So how do you do that at the I'm sorry? How do you do that Oh, how do we, so how do we actually support that notification mechanism? Yeah. Uh, so, so what we do is UART has this concept of a break character, which is essentially just uh, zero bytes with an extra zero at the end. So it looks, on the watch, it looks like a zero with a framing error, and we interpret that as sort of this not notification interrupt. So we perform this read request. Now let's go back to the smart strap code and see where it handles it. Again, it's within this feed if statement. Uh, so in this case, we're gonna call handle uptime request, because that's the read request that we're gonna get. That's the attribute that's gonna be requested. So here, again, I'm just verifying that the type is what we expect, which is a read, and then I'm writing the uptime back to the watch, uh, just the uptime in seconds, uh, back to the watch. So now on the watch side, we're gonna get a did read uh, callback. So if I look down, whoop, here we go. So here, it's the same as we saw before. I'm being passed the attribute, the result, and the actual data and its length. Uh, I'm just doing some sanity checks here, make sure that the attribute is the attribute that we actually perform the read for, uh, the uptime attribute, making sure that the result is smartshap result okay. It could be a timeout if the smartshap you know, disappeared or disconnected or something. And I'm also making sure that the length is what we expected, which in this case is gonna be four bytes because that uptime is represented as a four byte integer. Uh, and then lastly here, I'm just displaying what we got from the smart strap on the screen. Uh, again, this callback is passed in the data that we got, and you shouldn't be using this data outside of this function. It's only valid within uh, the scope of this function call. 
So that's how we make this simple demo that shows you sort of how to do reads uh, of the smart strap from the watch, shows you how to do notifications from the smart strap to the watch, and make write requests uh, from the watch to the smart strap. So the last thing I wanted to go through is just some links here. Um, the first link is just a Teensy setup guide if you happen to get a Teensy board, uh, which is uh, what the library is sort of built around. Uh, the next one is a link to the Arduino library that we provide. This is everything that you saw in the demo. And the third link is a link to our documentation on our developer website, which describes in detail what the SmartShot protocol looks like. Uh, if you're really interested, it actually goes through what the framing looks like, what all the bytes on the wire look like, and how the protocol works. Uh, you would, you know, if you want to develop your own library or you're just curious about that stuff, that would be a great place to start. And lastly, it walks through an example of both uh, the Pebble side and an Arduino side of how to talk between the watch and the smart shop. So the last thing I want to do is show some sort of examples of things that people have built. Uh, so this last weekend there was a hackathon in Boulder wh which was mainly smart shop focused and people made some pretty cool things. Uh, and some of these things were also made by internal Pebblers uh, just sort of in their spare time. So this first one is actually a Kickstarter. Uh, it's called <laughs> it's called Slazer. It's basically just a laser pointer attached to your watch, and uh, you might think that this is not a smart strap. And in some ways, you're right because it doesn't have any microcontroller on it. It's not using the smart strap protocol. But by my definition earlier, it is actually mechanically and physically mechanically and electrically connected to the watch. Uh, in this case, it's just sucking power from the watch, though. <laughs> Uh, so this next thing I actually have up here and I can show you uh, if after this uh, demo or later tonight. It's a basically programmable remote. So you can program any sort of TV remote into the watch and then you press a button and it sends that back out. Uh, all done through this smart strap which is on a breadboard. Uh, so the demo I have here is actually it controlling this little thing. I don't know what it's called. Uh, completely from the bevel uh, with the smart strap, of course. The next one, this was made uh, internally by a guy named Matt. Uh, and it's basically, he made this watch face and he's mirroring the watch face onto an external display. So yes, watch faces can use the smart strap protocol. Um, and in this case, you know, he's just using it to show on the display. So for example, if the watch face did something as an alarm or you know, did something special like that, he could use this as like a bedside sort of nightstand uh, to give a bigger display uh, to his pebble. He didn't make the watch face, it's trajectory. Oh, sorry, he didn't make the watch face. Uh, but he modified it to do the mirroring. That's, that's yeah, it's not running on watch power. <laughs> Uh, so the next thing made by the same guy actually, this is running completely on the watch power. It's basically just a chip tunes player, so you can select a sound to play on the watch, and it sends it over to, uh, this is a DigiSpark, which is an AT Tiny. It's just a really small, pretty low power microcontroller, and it's playing it through this little speaker that he has connected. Uh, this one was from the Hackathon. This won the Best Pebble Integration Award at Hackathon. This is an altimeter, and as you can see from the picture, it's completely powered from the watch, and it's even completely embedded into this uh, hammer strap. So this is a little altimeter sensor. This is their Teensy board, and it's just wired to the back of the watch, and it's showing the altitude on the screen. Uh, I don't know if you can read that, but it's 5292, which is about the altitude of Boulder, Colorado. Yeah, question? Uh, so from the watch, you can get 20 milliamps of power, uh, and it's 3.3 uh, volts. Yeah, 20 milliamps at 3.3 volts. Uh, I'm sorry? For how long? For how long? Maybe six hours or so, <laughs> if you're drawing a full 20 milliamps. Uh, if you need more power, you can. Always, there's, I mean, you could always have a battery in your smart strap, but ideally you would be able to power completely from the watch. And usually you wouldn't have the smart strap on drawing a full 20 milliamps all the time. Uh, so this next one was also from the hackathon. This is an NFC payment smart strap. So they have sort of their developer NFC card here connected to a Teensy connected to the watch. And they were selling this big yellow duck for $10. Uh, 
uh, and it actually did work. They were able to complete a whole transaction uh, through the Pebble, which I think is the first time ever anyone's bought anything with their Pebble. Uh, so completely not... using, yeah, besides like a loyalty card or gift card, I guess. Any questions? Yes? So uh, how do you wire the, the serial connection on the device side? On, so the question is, how do you wire the serial connection on the smart shop side? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so on that side, it depends on what board you're using. So the library has both a hardware and software serial mode. So in the hardware mode, you just connect the single data pin to both TX and RX. And in the software mode, it's just a single data pin on the smart shop side. Uh, so the only thing, the only, the question was if you need any sort of electronal, uh, or external electronics, and the only thing that you need is that pull up on the data line, as far as external electronics. Uh, if you're building like a, you know, more professional smart shop, we have uh, a more complicated schematic on our website, which actually uh, uses a open drain buffer to connect the TX to the data line, and has some sort of ESD protection uh, diodes in there as well. Another question? So you can just do something like what uh, the question was basically how do you actually connect to the back of the watch and you can do something like what the charging uh, cable does which is it just has pogo pins for the power and data pins and then has magnets on the ground pin. Uh, maybe. Uh, let me see if I can show it here. So those pins in the middle are sort of set, you know, into the watch. And if you look at, this is the adapter, uh, those middle pins you can see are little pogo pins that go up and down uh, with some a spring in there. So you can just get an extra charging cable and break it apart. Uh, if I think we actually, I brought a few extra if you're interested in doing that. Um, and then you solder onto the back. Soldering onto the magnet is kind of hard, but uh, it's doable. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so when you have a notification coming in of a break character from the display, what about, how do you, what about collisions? So one thing, the question was, how do we deal with collisions if we're getting notifications and trying to send it at the same time? Uh, and basically, what we do in the firmware is we actually have the TXNARX connected on the microcontroller, so we actually read back the data that we send. So we can detect if there was a collision based on the fact that we're reading back different data than we sent. In that case, we just stop sending and let the smart app do what it wants to do. Uh, it'll probably corrupt whatever we were trying to send, but we don't guarantee that the communication mechanism is fully you know, loss-proof anyways, so you have to have some retry or something to handle that. So a good application, a good application that uses this would check to see if that was received and verify. Yeah, so with the generic service, we have these acts. So you can, you actually get a callback. Uh, if it was a write request, we actually have a did write callback that you'll get when we get that act back, and that way you know that it was actually successful. I think I'm out of time. Thanks. <laughs>
Thank you, Brian. Never used one of these before. I'm really glad that Brian didn't take all the ones I wanted to talk about. <laughs> That's super cool. Uh, Brian, oh, you did. Oh, do you want it? Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> it seems to be working. Awesome. This is super weird for me. Wearable tech, what the hey. Uh, cool. So. Um, if you're not familiar already, which it sounds like lots of you aren't, which is pretty cool, um, Hackster is a project sharing platform for hardware hackers. Uh, so you can share the projects that you've built. For example, if you make a st smart strap, you can put it up, uh, including like your schematics, your code, uh, your bill of materials, and you can link it to all the platforms that you use. For example, Pebble and Teensy, uh, both if you made one of those ones that you were talking about. Um, then uh, it will show up on the platforms pages for both of those. So for example, do, do, do. Uh, we got Pebble is, ooh, sweet. Um, since we just had this hackathon, Pebble is right by the top. It's basically organized by what had the most recent activity. And so if you go here, you can see there are 38 projects. And when it loads. Um, you can see all the projects that have been uploaded, and you can also sort it by which type of pebble that you have. Most of this stuff is going to be compatible with both, I think, but the smart straps are only applicable to the pebble time. Um, so, as was mentioned, there was this awesome Pebble Rocks Boulder best name hackathon ever uh, in Boulder <coughs> last weekend. And I think it produced some of the highest quality hacks that we've seen so far. Um, so, we have a Hackathon uh, sharing um, platform. Let's see. I think it is slash H. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I thought I had this memorized, but clearly <laughs> this is not the case. Um, thanks, Catherine. Here we go. Uh, so I wanted to share some of my faves. Um, this is also on our blog, if you want to check it out uh, later. So we've featured the absolute <coughs> best ones at PRB <coughs> on the blog. Um, so these ones, I think, are the best. Um, Peblets is a way of connecting your smart strap to little bits so that um, you can program your Pebble to talk to a huge variety of DIY electronics. Little Bits is a hugely popular uh, electronics development platform that is really popular with people who have children uh, or people who have never worked with electronics before. It snaps together like Lego and it's really easy to work with. Um, so I can show you that. Um, they look like these little brightly colored pieces of candy with electronics embedded in them. So you're not going to eat them, but like this. Ideally, I mean, that could be edible smart straps. Is that a thing yet? Yeah. Fantastic. So, robotics. Um, we had robotics. We had um, little animal 3D printed things. We had music. We had um, graffiti apps. We had, uh, what else do we have? We had. Um, I think that says tomato, but I, don't, I think it's actually about bikes. Uh, it was this one, tourniquet. Uh, so it's basically a controllable uh, bike signal that gives you directions for Google Maps, and then it signals when you're supposed to turn so that cars don't hit you, which is pretty fantastic. So we picked these projects in part. Sorry? Why? I know, right? Well. I'll go back to this page um, and tell you why we picked these ones. It's because they're extremely well documented. So uh, what we want to advance here is basically we want to be a, a place for anyone to learn electronics, particularly focusing on people who come from a software background. Uh, and you can learn from each other more specifically. So if you're a person who makes stuff, then you can share your own projects. You can add them to your portfolio. You can import stuff from your own site or link to it, and it'll show up in your profile. Uh, but what we really want is for you to share 
your code, schematics, bill of materials, any CAD files for 3D printed stuff, like the time doc, I think I commented on that being like, give us your files, because I might actually want to build that. Um, and uh, so you get cred for it, obviously. You get people's respect. Uh, it's basically our version of liking or favoriting. Um, and you get the satisfaction of knowing that you're teaching other people. And if you're a learner, it's really easy because every project that we feature has these core components that let you basically rebuild it or build on top of it. Now, when you do add a project, you get um, respect from people, you get views and stuff, and this earns you uh, reputation points, which you can use to buy stuff in our free store. So we really want you to teach and learn from each other. Uh, and in fact, Pebble is offering uh, stuff through our free store. So if you've uploaded projects, um, you can get new hardware to play with. And this way, the system sort of feeds back into itself. And you can uh, basically rewarding the people who uh, may or may not be able to afford lots of tech, but are really excited about learning and teaching um, to do more of that. And then the last thing that I will say is um, Another thing that we're trying to do to get more involved in physical communities, because we don't just want to be online, is we're doing a meetup uh, every second and fourth Tuesday of the month. If that's too confusing, you can just join our meetup. It's meetup.com slash hackster dash SF. Um, and our first one is on the 29th. It's at Geekdom, which is just like three blocks that way. I get that a lot of you Pebblers are down in Palo Alto, so maybe you hate us. But um, come by anyway. We love you. It'll be great. Yeah, right? Uh, yeah, we want to see you. Uh, um, in the meantime, I guess I'll show you the rest of the cool stuff that people built. Here's that uh, bike one. Do I have any more time? Am I over? Am I under? Cool. Oh, I'll show you um, what I think is one of my favorites is this. Uh, the reason I chose this one is that they're such awesome sports. They mention how they were collaborating with other teams um, to model stuff. They were uh, providing other teams with uh, little docks so that they could hack on their stuff better without it jostling around. And in return, they got help with some of their software stuff. And this is exactly the kind of stuff that we want to bring. Uh, so I would definitely encourage you to join. You can get free hardware. You can help other people out. It makes you feel good, hopefully. And uh, it makes us feel good, too. That's about all I got. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> all right, I'm going to put this on now. OK, so we have a couple of people that wanted to demo pebbly things that are not necessarily smart strap related. So uh, the best demo, uh, most creative demo, rather, at this time, for something that you've actually created on Pebble, uh, we want to see kind of what you've been working on, maybe since the last meetup, maybe you've never come before, and want to show what you've made in the past uh, or what you're currently working on. The best Pebble app or watch face demo is going to win a Pebble time. And then after that, I want to see what you guys have uh, in terms of ideas for smart straps. Something that you uh, had an idea about what you'd like to make, something maybe you want help from other people in order to create. And if there's anything that you want to make that involves little modules like maybe GPS or LEDs, we have a bunch of little boards from Jado. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce that. Uh, that we are totally happy and willing to give you. The best three ideas for smart straps, I again, uh, as I said before, have little uh, connectors for you. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to have Chris come up. Can you use the mark? I use this mark script thing. I will set it up again. Oh, uh, can you bring back the uh, camera? I'll give you this. Uh oh. Are you official?
Okay, can you hear me? So I've got a hack I want to show you, and it's not a cool hack, it's a hacked with a machete. So I got this uh, really cheap Milanese band off eBay for like five bucks. Uh, I also got some uh, cheap pins and they rusted when I was swimming. So I, I got some quick release tabs and I just filed away the metal on the, uh, on the Milanese strap. So I got quick release on my Milanese strap. It looks terrible, but no one knows from the front what it looks like. So that's hack number one. Um, hack number two is, have you heard of watch face generator? It's an online um, watch face generator. I've invented something way, way worse than that. It's very limited, but <laughs> it was cool for me. So I've got a couple of uh, watch faces. So this is one of them. If you like uh, Mass Effect, you may recognize the logo. Um, I have another one. Come on. Uh, which basically has the same kind of feature set, but it looks completely different. Uh, and the differences between those two watch faces is like um, five or six lines in a header file. So the actual watch code is identical for both of these. So if you're not a C developer, if you don't want to write a config for your application, this is ready to rock. You just tweak a few bits and bobs. Uh, it uses Kirby Slate for doing config. So it actually looks pretty, it looks pretty on your watch when you're doing config. It, you can change the background and the, uh, the text color, and it's got vibration um, on or off support. A lot of people don't like vibration on BT, uh, Bluetooth disconnect. I like it. Um, and you get that for free just by using this watch face template. It's on GitHub. And finally, if you want to do a little bit more um, coding, uh, you can still use the same library, but do a slightly more complicated stuff. So this actually changes the image once, a, once every minute. It changes it initially just to show you it changes. And that's it. Mind in my two minutes? Okay. All right, Eric, come on up. <laughs> uh, so this is about um, the strap, actually. Did you want to save oh, that yeah. for later? No, it's fine. We can do well. Do you need to put your computer in? Yeah, let's save it. You okay. can call someone right. else. Hey, John, where are you? There you are. Come up. John's got a new update. He does cool stuff every time. I don't know if this is just a concept for a... Uh... Hi. Um, so me again. Uh, somewhere around here is a camera, I see. Um, so uh, I'm John Brewer. You may know me from such Pebble app as uh, wrist vision, which is now in color, coming in color. Ooh. But uh, make it recursive. It probably, it probably already is. But uh, unfortunately, the lighting in here. Give me some light. Give me some light. There you go. That's. There we go, that's me. Um, anyway, so that's, that's an existing app. Um, as soon as we deal with some bandwidth issues, that, the color version, the black monochrome version is already in the store. Black and uh, white version, uh, the color version will be there soon. Uh, the other thing I've been interested in lately, besides doing Pebble stuff, is, uh, I'm just going to turn the puppy on, is uh, infrared cameras. This is long wave infrared, so this is the temperature range wherein uh, there we go. So, if only you could see this. But uh, well, I'll show you. I'll show you right here. Um, let's see. Put it under. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can see. Actually, let's slide this over toward the edge here. And then I can shoot off the edge here. Okay, um, here we got. So there you can see this is a in infrared view of my my hand here. Uh, this is using a. Let me do that for a second. One, two, three. 
And now you can see the actual infrared fingerprints of the heating of the floor from that. This uh, module here, this is a commercial module, but it's using a device called a Fleur Lepton, which I didn't bring with me. Uh, but what I want to do is hook this up to, uh, with a smart strap so you can have uh, infrared vision on your wrist. That's pretty expensive though, right, the Fleurs? Uh, this is like a $150 component for the, for the Lepton, yeah. Here, so that's, that's my idea. Thanks. Okay. All right, so before we switch over to more smart strappy kind of things, does, does anybody have any apps that maybe they want to show they've been working on or concepts or apps that they think are really cool? Watch faces that they've made they want to show off to everybody? Going once, going twice. No? All right, so um, Eric, let's have you come up and talk about your smart strap idea. Mm -hmm. Did it come up? Okay, cool. So I had this idea for a smart strap. I haven't yet um, destroyed um, a, a, a charging cable in order to hook up yet, but um, I've destroyed a lot of other stuff, electronic, because I'm a software guy and that's what we do to hardware. Um, mostly burn it up. So I had this idea for something um, that would put a little bit of sound on the pebble, mostly just for fun. Um, I did a um, disco ball at the de a developer retreat that was controlled via Bluetooth low energy. Um, it was actually a dis disco ball hat, so very useful, important, groundbreaking wearable technology. It's not just about the wrist. Um, and let's see. So um, this is uh, a bit of sound coming out of um, something called an Esprino, which I can show you guys. I brought one along with me. And um, it, the Esprino is actually like an Arduino, but you can program it in JavaScript, which is cool. Um, I, I love programming with the uh, Arduino and with Raspberry Pi, but um, it's sort of an appealing idea to have JavaScript everywhere from our wearables up to the cloud um, with things like Node. Um, so this is a little quarter-sized speaker that I would use on this. Um, I don't have this part yet, but I have everything else. This is the Esprino Pico, which is small enough to actually fit on, on a um, strap. Um, and as you can see, one end of it is actually a USB um, plug, so that's how you program it. Um, this is a 500 milliamp battery, and this is a rough layout of how the stuff would look like on my um, Pebble Time. Um, this is a project that I built before, actually. Um, this is uh, a larger Esprino um, that's actually its own smartwatch um, with uh, its own display. Um, so I'm pretty sure that it's buildable. Um, why would you have this? You could have it as a little musical instrument. So if I wanted to sing happy birthday to someone here, um, we could, um, I could start it up and depending on the position, of the watch using the accelerometer, it might play C, F, or G chords. So three chord, anything you can sing with three chords. Um, you could also make it more, the Pebble more accessible by making it a talking smartwatch. Um, you might be able to perhaps read from the timeline. Um, and of course, make an audible alarm. Um, so you would, uh, basically, you know, using the accelerometer, you would detect the position of the hand. Um, in order to um, in order to figure out what to play um, if you're playing music. That's it. Thank you. All right, so now I'm gonna open it up to the floor. Does anybody wanna come up and tell me about some cool idea they have for a smart strap now that you've been hanging out for, for a while listening to smart straps? Come on up. Thank you. 
So I don't have any kind of cool presentation prepared like that. Um, I actually just found out about this today, so uh, spur of the moment. Um, so my idea for uh, the SmartStrap app um, really comes from a project that I did in the past on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm a security guy myself, uh, and I went to, uh, it's partly inspired by the previous, previous project as well as something that I saw at, uh, at DEF CON this year, which if, in case you don't know is a really, really big hacking conference in Las Vegas every year. Um, so I was there and one of the guys on the floor was walking around with, he had a, if you imagine a athletic wristband um, around your wrist, he had a large one of those and in it he had his own basic version of a smartwatch that he had created using a Arduino. And it was really cool because he had um, some really fun uh, uses for it, including uh, dealing with wireless. Um, so one of the projects that I had in the past was using the Raspberry Pi basically created, um, uh, in case you don't know what uh, war walking is, war walking is, or war driving or whatever, is the idea of driving around, walking around with a wireless antenna. And um, if, you, if you really wanna make it uh, a little more accurate, you can also use GPS. Uh, and what I had is I had basically a Raspberry Pi set up uh, with a GPS unit and it was completely headless and had a uh, wireless adapter connect connected to it. And as I walked around, it would constantly scan for uh, wireless networks nearby and it would make note of the GPS coordinate as well as the encryption level. So if it was like only WEP, which is trivial to crack nowadays, um, it would show me on a map where those locations were, where there was open Wi-Fi, where there was you know, more secured Wi-Fi, and the names of all the Wi-Fi addresses with the locations. So um, that's essentially what war walking is. So the idea is to do something like that with a smartwatch. Um, ideally, the lowest level of power possible would be great. So like, uh, instead of using a USB powered uh, G GPS unit, something on, uh, like a GPS unit on the actual board itself would probably be a lot easier. But uh, just the general concept I feel like is pretty feasible with you know, with the smart strap, and uh, I think it'd be pretty, pretty fun to play around with. So that's my idea. Thanks, Aaron. All right, who's up next? Tell me, Alex. What do you want to make? Uh, I play around a lot with um, EEG, and I think it'd be rad to. I mean, the Pebble already has Bluetooth capabilities, so most of the commercially available EEG devices you can already connect to. But um, there's one where you can do an Arduino hack with it that makes it a lot easier to talk to it with your own apps. And more specifically, smart strap focused, I think it'd be rad to make one with Nitinol, AKA muscle wire. So what it does is when you pass current through it, it heats up a bit and it contracts a bit. Not like a lot, but about 10% maximum. Obviously you want it, wouldn't want it doing that much, but um, it's a really cool way to give people feedback without it being vibrational, which can be kind of jarring. So for EEG, I think it'd be really cool to give you haptic feedback in that fashion uh, and let you know when you're like at your most relaxed or your most focused or a combination of the two, which is like measuring alpha and beta waves. Um, and another application for that, uh, the Nitinol, is uh, it's often people talk about building apps that connect people over distance, so like, I've always liked the idea of making a sort of hug bracelet where like if somebody triggers something on there and then you get a little like wrist hug from them. It'd be really cool. I like this idea. All right, who's next? Come tell us what you want to make or what you think would be really cool in, in an ideal future. Like what would you have as a smart strap? Anyone? Do you just want to go to the bathroom and get another drink? Is that what's, is that what's going on? Yeah, just want me to stop talking? Cool. Um, okay, so, do you want to come up? Or were you agreeing that yes, that's really what you want to do? <laughs> All right, one more idea, and then, and then we'll wrap things up. Yeah? Oh no, that's just Tomah. Hi, Stuart. Hello. Um, what about a, a pick me app? Oh, I just, I, I just used it. Um, is when you raise your hand, um, the, uh, the speaker gets a, a list of people who want to be picked. Here, pick me. <laughs> Works for bigger audiences, I think. No worries. Thanks, Stuart. All right, one more, come on, yeah, yeah. Tamal, you wanna tell us what your favorite smart trap idea is? Do you have one? Okay, all right. So we're gonna go with Ross and then Tomah's gonna come up. Hey, so I was thinking more of a mechanical style smart strap. Um, 
So there's the shoes in Back to the Future that you push a button and the laces strap on, like uh, either a metal or a um, silicone strap where you like load the app on the watch and it like sucks up to your wrist, perfectly sized. It's kind of cool. So. Sorry. Thanks, Ross. All right, Tama, what crazy thing are you gonna show us? Alec, do you have an idea now because of the shoes? A tiny idea? All right, we're gonna let Tama go and then you can, you can come wrap it up. So um, if you want to build something that you want to wear, but you don't want to solder or, you know, you love your breadboard and you're afraid of uh, duct taping a breadboard to your arm, you know, I've lost a few, I've lost a few hair this way. So uh, this weekend at the Boulder Hackathon, I made this uh, 3D printable pebble plus breadboard holder. As, as you can see, you can strap it to your arm. Uh, so you just need to uh, either power it from the pebble or add a battery pack. And this way you can carry your hack directly onto your arm. And it has a very, very cool uh, predator kind of look. So if you want to check it out, I, I just have this one here. But I, I've, I'll try to bring a few more at the next uh, meetup and uh, we'll, we'll give them away. Thank you. I'll, I'll put it on my arm, it looks much better. Thanks, Thanks Shema. All right, Alec, what do you got for us? And then we'll wrap this up. And then you can go, get drinks, go to the bathroom, and then we'll come back in like 10 minutes and give away prizes. So, so I've been playing with these, these little pan tilt zoom uh, servo stepper motor driven uh, uh, camera mounts from, uh, from drones. Uh, you know, really great, you know, 11 bucks in, in the little envelope from China. Uh, so I was thinking also in mounting, mounting little laser, a little laser on, on it and sort of moving it around the room. Well, and, and what, what Tama was, was showing there sort of is, is, might be a good platform for it, just, just to be able to have a little pan tilt zoom with a laser to intimidate people with. And, and uh, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, it's more intimidation and just have it sort of pan the ceiling and, and that sort of thing. Anyway. Thanks, Alec. All right, ready, set, break. Let's come back here in like 10 minutes. I'll round you guys up again. Grab a drink, go to the bathroom, uh, talk amongst yourselves. We are going to deliberate and then we'll all come back here, give away some prizes, have a good time, and then see you all next time.